to yes as we continue to gain more knowledge on this very important topic uh, specifically pain management in pregnancy and so uh, since our facilitator is here with us we're glad or i'm glad to uh, introduce him uh, dr gilbert mwaka is uh, he works in aga khan and is a consultant anesthetist and a consultant pain uh, specialist he has good amount of qualification from studied from i mean in makerere university uh, uh, university of aga khan university of sydney australia and uh, he's the best for this topic. His areas of interest include interventional pain management and cognitive behavioral therapy. He's also a member of the Kenya Society of Anesthesiologists. And we are happy that uh, he agreed to uh, honorably give us the talk. And without much ado, I would want to welcome Dr. Gilbert Mwaka to take us from there. And as he comes, we'll be happy to take any questions that you have to, at the end of the presentation. So feel free to write in your questions on the uh, Q&A. And if you need us to maybe be notified or anything, just write it there and we'll acknowledge for the end. So Karibu Sana, Dr. Gilbert, we are happy to have you. Uh, uh, thank you very much, uh, David and Esther. I'd like to share my slides now. Okay, as it, as it, David and Esther said, I um, I work at Aga Khan University Hospital where I do pain management and anesthesiology. I did anesthesia first, then pain management. But these days I, I write pain management first. Uh, it's very uh, dear to me. My background, I am of Rwandan descent, but born and raised in Uganda. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Thank you. Uh, born and raised in, and educated in Uganda. I started in Makerere, uh, finished in, uh, should I say the years? I may look, end up looking a, a dinosaur. In nine, in two thousand, <laughs> finished in time three ship in two thousand one, and uh, went to work in Rwanda. At that time, uh, there were still the need of many medical officers. I worked there for four years, and then came to Kenya, where I studied the uh, anesthesia with Aga Khan, and uh, uh, also was sponsored to to cover a med pain management in the of Sydney. And then I looked for something that can give me good interventional skills quickly. Uh, I went to India. I did a, a, a fellowship of interventional pain management. Right now, I'm very interested in, in cognitive behavioral therapy because uh, there's a lot of psychosocial uh, aspect to managing pain and what the patients go through. So in terms of pain money, in terms of pregnancy, you notice know, is something that is highly pursued, whether knowingly or unknowingly. Uh, unknowingly, people look for fun, and then they say, oops, I got pregnant. And then there's also the, the adventure of self-discovery, as well as the, the persuasive power of young men or young women over men uh, during that period of self-discovery. Uh, however, during the COVID-19 period of lockdowns, uh, there was a lot of uh, ways of distressing and they uh, led to, to pregnancies. And uh, you can see the countries that support uh, pre uh, pregnant adolescent mothers to attend the schools. Uh, being the, the ones which look uh, more vibrant are the uh, East African uh, side of Africa. And Kenya is among them. Um, in terms of knowingly, uh, you can see once people get married or fall in love, love has to be consummated or marriage has to be consummated and eventually they get pregnant. And those who get pregnant and have uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, infertility issues, they pursue it uh, aggressively. 
you find that sometimes it has a significant financial imp implication on them, but they are looking to get to, to get pregnant. And so there are many reasons that lead to pregnancy. And this opens up possibilities of encountering pain in pregnancy. And so in that case, you have to, to be able to recognize pain. Pain is a common complaint in pregnancy. In the US, around 57% of pregnant women report at least one visit to the emergency department. And in Germany, around 28% of the pregnancy visits to, to emergency department are pain related. Some of the common pain conditions are headache, pain, back pain, abdominal or pelvic pain, and traumatic pain. In terms of headache, you have subarachnoid hemorrhage, uh, HELP syndrome, uh, preeclampsia, eclampsia, acute angle closure glycoma, carbon monoxide toxicity, temporal arteritis, cervical artery dissection, cerebral uh, cavernous thrombosis syndrome, sorry for the uh, spelling, meningitis, encephalitis, and the idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Uh, for back pain, we have coda equina syndrome, abdominal aortic aneurysm, spinal epidural abscess or osteomyelitis, um, spinal fracture, traumatic or pathological malignancy or tumor. And then for abdominal pelvic pain, was, uh, oh, I went backwards, sorry. Die. Yeah, for abdominal pelvic pain, you have HELP syndrome, pyelonephritis, appendicitis, a typical acute coronary syndrome, uh, which can be mistaken also with, uh, I mean, can be mistaken for um, MI, but can be many things, including the uh, gastritis and the osophagitis or um, stretch of the abdominal uh, viscera. Placental abrasional placenta, uterine rupture, fetal demise or miscarriage, ectopic pregnancy, active labor, bowel dissection. Most of these things you have encountered them. Uh, for traumatic pain, there's pain secondary to trauma, motor vehicle collision, falls, which warrant a full traumatic screening and evaluation, domestic violence. Consider that this uh, consider this when evaluating a traumatic uh, pregnant mother. She may not want to report the husband, but it could be uh, something in the background. Now. Whenever you meet a pain patient, there are two flags that you look at. Because uh, pain can become, uh, is, can, is mainly a symptom, but it can also be uh, kind of a disease. But when it's a symptom, first rule out red flags. See if the patient has uh, bleeding, abdominal pain, swollen hands or face, rapid weight gain, itching. A persistent headache, persistent back pain, blurry vision, fever, baby moving less often, or a gush of fluid. And these are things that you can you can educate mothers and or create uh, education material for the public to take home so that they look out for those things and not just confuse them for for other uh, other symptoms because that can delay care. And then we also have the psychosocial flags or yellow flags. These allow us to identify aspects of the person or the problem or their social context and how they affect recovery and return to workplace. It can help to identify patients who are at risk of developing chronic disability and may not recover as expected from their condition. And once, once you have, once you deal with the red flags, because if you go full blown pain management strategies without looking at the red flags, uh, say somebody comes and says, oh, I have a headache and just give paracetamol or any other strong analgesic without considering the red flags, those red flags will fester. Now, if you consider the red flags, but don't consider the yellow flags, you may also encounter difficulty in getting full for recovery of the patient. So it, it is very beneficial to identify the patients with that risk of, uh, of uh, yellow flags because it can lead to developing chronic disability and not recover the way you would want them to recover. And so the patient keeps coming and you're wondering what's wrong. And everybody goes and they screen them, they find everything is normal, but 
possibility is the environment where they are that is causing problems. Then they so they enable us, enable us to work from a biopsychosocial model. We are we are generally highly trained in the biomedical model. Basically, you have a medical problem, a biological problem, we have a medical solution. You have a headache, we give you paracetamol, you go away or diclofenac. You have a fracture, we fix it. Uh, you have appendicitis, uh, we remove the appendix. And then we deal with the pain of the surgery. Uh, if you have a fracture, we fix it and then take you to physio and all that. We don't need to know how this thing is making you sleep badly or, or, or with a hip fracture, how you are performing sexually and all that stuff. However, when it comes to chronic diseases, including pain, pain, you have to address the biological problem, but then look at its impact on the psychology of the patient, as well as the, the social aspect of that patient or the social structure of that patient. Because uh, the, the, the patient and this, their social structure can feed off each other. And so the patient comes to you, understands what you are going through, uh, I mean, what, what they're going through and what you have explained, they go home, the relatives ask them other questions or similar questions, and now they can't even answer. So they become distressed. They come back the next day with the pain. And we found that uh, depression, anxiety, mood disorders are highly uh, present, uh, prevalent in pain patients. And also pain patients have a lot of that so they keep there's a kind of vicious cycle or cycle. So by knowing the psychosocial flags, you, this gives us a framework for assessment and planning, because uh, one has to formulate a plan of care for the patient, and you don't stop just in the clinic. You also store or, or in the biological or physiological aspect of the problem. You also have to include the psychosocial aspect uh, of care. So these flags are not a diagnosis or a symptom, but an indication that someone may not recover as expected and may need additional support to return to work. The flags are often referred to as obstacles to recovery. And so the psychosocial factors determine outcomes such as activity levels, participation, and work, but appear to be less relevant to reporting to the, to the reporting of symptoms. And so patients kind of uh, hide them. Most, most, not most patients. Not, not most pain patients. All pain patients. I can say all pain patients are inauthentic. They are not authentic. They don't show you the true self. Number one, especially if it's chronic pain, they hide. They don't like being asked about their pain as often. They want to be normal. So when you go out with them or you visit them and start asking about their pain, they will, they will tell you something a quick answer so that you, you you don't ask them so much. And so they have to be teased out of the patient. You, you have to know the questions that can bring the patient to give you an answer. Now let me give you an example for post-operative pain, pain patients. You can go and ask a patient, how are you doing? Um, I'm fine, they're in bed, I'm fine. Is your pain, uh, how's your pain? Ah, it's well controlled. And uh, you sure yeah, how much uh, they don't tell you much. Uh, they, sometimes they don't want to give the number. Then if you ask them, did you manage to go to toilet? They say, no, I did not go to toilet. Why? Uh, when I, whenever I move, I have pain. And uh, are you drinking well? No, I'm not drinking well because I fear to have urine and then start moving around. So it develop, it develop, they develop what we call a fear avoidance behavior. And we don't want them to go into a fear avoidance belief because beliefs are harder to, to eradicate. So you have to find a way, a, a tact of, of getting them to speak. And so there's a lot of collapsing of things, especially when pain happens and pain comes with it. Uh, you know, all, uh, from CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, we, we get to know patient or psychology, we get to know patients are meaning or human beings are meaning making machines. And so you can imagine if pain strikes most of the time and it is very unpleasant, uh, the kind of meaning people make. So what happens is that when something happens, people make a meaning and they get assigned, they assign it to uh, a, a reality or that meaning kind of 
creates a reality. And because it happens so instantaneously and so fast, they start becoming blind to what happened. They don't see even the, what triggered them to have uh, that reality they have. And so when you have pain patients, ask them and discover the facts. Uh, I will take them back to facts. And that's why uh, things like life coaching, cognitive behavioral therapy, or psychotherapy are very important in healthcare because you are able to give patients tools to go back and look at uh, at what caused the what what the facts are because their meaning obscures the fact but if they look at the fact they are going to make a new meaning and which will may transform their reality so this is a, a table ex giving you examples of the flag color and the nature of flags and examples of clinical signs i'll share this these these slides with the esther and she can give them to you if you want and so you can look at the red flag. This is serious, uh, signs of serious pathology called equina, fracture, tumor, remitting night pain, sudden weight loss, all that. Orange are psychiatric symptoms like clinical depression, personality disorder. Yellow flags are beliefs, appraisals, ju judgments, for example, unhelpful unhe beliefs about pain, indication of injury as uncontrollable or likely to worsen, expectations of poor treatment outcome, delayed return to work. And so some patients some patients uh, look at a, they can have a problem and they tell them come quickly to accident emergency. And because of the meaning they made previously that they will go and spend many hours in the line, they say, okay, I'll come in the evening when they, there are fewer people or something like that. And possibly they are feeling like they are reduced fetal movements or certain pain. And then, and you know, pain can also be uh, episodic and so when the episode is low uh, or low pain uh, they relax a bit so you when you're teaching them educating them give them that uh, open up open them to such scenarios so that they they don't underestimate them emotional responses like distress not meeting criteria of diagnosis of mental disorder worries fears anxiety uh, anxiety fear, all these things stress the body and can stress the pregnancy and find get premature labor and all that. So if you involve a psychiatrist uh, just to make a diagnosis, to see whether it is a mild uh, anxiety or uh, severe, um, and maybe the patient needs some medication or not, and just also reassure the patient because they have the, the tools to do that. Pain behavior, including painting and coping strategies, avoidance of activities due to expectations of pain and possible re-injury of over reliance of passive treatments. You may have to explore who they were before they got pregnant. And that kind of personality can spill over into to the pregnancy state. And uh, I, I think my wife won't my, mind. Uh, my wife is very, very active. And uh, so when she gets pregnant, she gets really active and then she feels like funny, but keep active. But the moment she gets more, she's pregnant. Oh my God, she just lies down and uh, takes care of the baby and uh, that activity. Even I cannot even motivate her into moving until she delivers and then she's busy again. And so there are those things that you have to look uh, out for. Get, basically, get to know your patient. Blue flags, perceptions about the relationship between work and health. These are the ones which make people complain about the workplace and then the workplace becomes very toxic to them. And so you may have to engage also the, 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 the bosses, uh, the supervisors, and teach them, or even the husbands, and teach them, look here, this is who you're dealing with, and this is expected. When you remove the pain, you will see your beautiful person, you've always, uh, the one you employed or the one you married, they reappear. But pain becomes like a, some demon that has possessed them or something like that. Then you have... Uh, black or symptom, uh, black flags with system or contextual obstacles, uh, legislature restricting options to return to work, conflict with insurance staff over injury. And some of them is like this one, we talked about uh, uh, governments allowing pregnant teenagers to go to school. Somebody raised the, their hand. David, are we dealing with it in, uh, later or we can do it with it now? Esther? 
Okay. Uh, sorry, you, what the question? Uh, that while, I uh, while I was talking, somebody raised their hand. We can deal with those later after you're done with the with the presentation. So carry on. Uh, and then I think I might very fast. Uh, no, you're good. Uh, it's only that I think the network connectivity at some point was not very good, but now we can hear you very well. Okay, well, whatever they miss, they can ask, uh, write them down and they ask later. Sure. Thanks. Okay, so after all that, knowing the red flags and yellow flags and the, all the flags you can think of, uh, then you can start thinking of assessing this patient. Well, now you're equipped with how to, 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 to dig out information from them. Mm -hmm. And when we look at pain, we look at pain assessment tools. There are dimensional tools and dimensional tools. Unid dimensional tools can be the verbal rating scales, the numerical rating scales, and the visual analog scales. The verbal rating and numerical rating are almost similar, and they, but they come from zero to ten. Now, usually zero is a, sorry, zero is a no pain, and ten is the wa the worst pain imaginable. Why we say imaginable is because you, the, there is uh, uh, there are people who you are about to inject or put a cannula or draw blood and they kind of or vaccinate and they kind of squirm around. They want to move off and run away and all that. And when you finish doing the procedure, the, the, the injection, they say, oh, it's not as bad as I thought. Why? You remember the meaning making machine we were talking about? In their reality, they've created a, a perception that this pain is going to be too much. And for them, they will experience that exactly like as if it is true. And so we say 10 out of 10 is almost pain out of this world. Now, I usually use a scale of zero to 10 to ask the patients how much pain they have. And I teach them this way. I, I, I use women as an example because they are the cohort of human beings who suffer a lot of pain and from starting from young age. So through periods, labor pain, uh, UTIs, fibroids, all that stuff, they go through many surgeries. So they experience a lot of pain compared to men. But I use that them as an example to explain, especially for men to understand this, and I use periods. So if you have a scale of zero to 10, zero being no pain, one to three, I want you to visualize this. One to three is pain, which is mild. Four to six is moderate pain seven to nine severe pain. Some people said nine to 10, seven to 10 severe, but I leave nine to 10 as excruciating pain to mean the pain that is unimaginable or out of this world. Pain in their own world, basically. So pain of mild pain, one to three, is like a woman who has periods but does not need medication. Pain of four to six, moderate pain, now they need tablets. Pain of seven to nine, they need an injection at a clinic nearby or accident emergency. Then the tablets seem to work. So they usually get uh, diclofenac, tramadol, or pethidine, or morphine. Then they take the tablets. Then pain of, of nine to 10 is pain, uh, excruciating pain. Is pain like a pain for stage four adenomyosis or endometriosis. Every time they have a period, they get admitted. Every time they have a period, they get admitted. And some of them now start losing jobs because they are, there's overflow, there's, they are debilitating. It's basically, it's debilitating pain. Now, if you look at the other pain of one to three, mild pain, four to six, moderate pain, us men and other women may never know that woman's pain. Why? Because that woman is functional. And why do they function is because they have coping skills and coping strategies. You know, from the moment you are born as a girl, you at one certain age, you are told you start bleeding, you start having periods and they may be painful, don't worry. So they learn coping skills. However, when we do pain management, we do not promise, especially non-cancer non pain, we do not promise pain of zero. If we promise pain of zero, either you're going to be numb from local anesthetics we give, or you are going to have to be very highly medicated from the, from the, 
from the analgesics we give. So I, I said, when you're managing pain, manage it to level of one to three. Uh, that pain of one to three is like that woman who has uh, mild pain with periods. That woman is going to dance, is going to cook, is going to do all sorts of things, uh, I think, uh, uh, apart from sex. Uh, but uh, they will function normally. And, uh, and so a man who has had the fracture of the hip and the postoperative with the pain is a lot. If you give them analgesics up to one to three, they'll be able to do their physiotherapy, they'll read books, they'll do whatever. They, if they are online people, they'll do their work online. Now, that's the scale of zero to 10. However, the visual analog, analog scale is a, is a strip, which is 100 millimeters, and you give to a patient to, uh, and it is not marked. The patient ticks wherever they think the pain is, zero to 100, and then you go, and you correlate it with another strip that is marked. And for you, you, you get to know. So there's kind of a blinding from the patient. And then the next time you bring it back and they, and a, a clean one, and then ask them how much pain they have and they tick as well. So that's how we use those tools. However, they don't deal with the psychosocial aspect that much. And these are some of the other tools you can use, uh, especially for people who are in labor. Uh, and you can explore them later. Mm -hmm. Then in terms of pain intensity, you ask, well, are they trying to say that when the patient's standing and leaning, like she's still tolerating pain and when she's in this position, uh, it's wiped her over like that. So you, you, there are questions you can, you can design for your patient or for your, for your population. What I want you to take away today is to explore that psychosocial aspect of pain. Uh, the biological aspect comes very, very easily. And so easy to ask the, the, the VAS, or the, the numerical rating scale, how much pain do you have out of 10? That you can ask when you are walking away. However, if you find it, you have to also to, to be able to read the patient's uh, body language. Uh, some of them come and they're seated or they're looking nice and they're not even answering your question, but they are rubbing their thigh, they're rubbing their back. Those, those are telltale signs something's happening. They are fidgety, they are pacing around, uh, they look at you with some cynicism or something. They, they are dealing with something. So use, use all that. And so these are some of the examples of tools you can use. Uh, and this shows you how people are coping well. Uh, with whatever they have in terms of pain. This is a scale of zero to 10. You can see no pain to unable to move pain. And, and when, you, uh, when, I, when I've read unable to move pain, I've remembered something. Uh, when you're scoring pain, don't, as I told you, people like uh, uh, pain patients like to go for the easy thing. So they'll tell you that, oh, my pain is well controlled, but they're still either they're seated or standing or not moving. So when you want to know whether you're controlling pain well, ask on movement. Ask for pain at rest, but also for pain on movement. That, that helps a lot to, to tell you where the patient is at. So what's the pain management? The trick is to have a multimodal treatment strategy. And it can be it can be non-pharmacological and pharmacological. In pharmacology, non-pharmacological, you can use physical therapy, and in this physical therapy, teach the patient. You know, the 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 human being is very interesting. We all have a mind and with a thought process, and the thought process is like uh, maybe like an operating system, and God has a, God or the higher power has put uh, all the apps for each human being, all the apps that you can think of, apps for worries, anxiety, happiness, and all that stuff. Now, when you're not in pain, there are some predominantly active apps. So if we say we looked at your data, data log, which, which items you are using more, they may be like happiness, sadness, and some, occasionally you're depressed, occasionally you're worrying, and all that. But when you have pain, they flip and you have the most negative ones becoming uh, more predominant. 
And we, in psychology, there's something called automatic negative thoughts. When people are in pain, they generate a lot of that. Uh, and sometimes it can become so noisy that they don't even know, they're also overwhelmed. Uh, they don't even have the skills anymore. They call, you know those coping skills the girls have? They become really uh, bad uh, and, and, and they can't even, they can't uh, interrupt them, so they need help. So sometimes when people are doing physiotherapy and pain increases, there are certain predominant thoughts that uh, occur. And so when they're in your office or in the bed, uh, admitted or at home, they are okay. But when they go to the physio, they generate these automatic negative thoughts. And so they will start not wanting to go to do the physio. And then ergonomics, uh, how they are, how how their musculoskeletal system is like at the workplace or at home or in their bed. Uh, do you need a pillow between your thighs, on your neck, something like that? Do you need a standing table that uh, adjusts the height when you are working because now you have leg pain, all that stuff. Then trans uh, transcutaneous electrical nerve stimulation is very powerful. You know, those plates of uh, of uh, uh, electrodes they use that plated electrodes for for the skin on the back. Sometimes they are used a, a lot in labor, but you can also use them uh, before labor uh, if they have trigger points in their muscles and the massaging is not working. Water therapy helps a lot to ease te tense muscles. In terms of pharmacology, you know the classification of these dangerous drugs and uh, all that. Uh, I, I, I always work, as I said, Mart model analgesia. I always work together with the, uh, because pain is so multifactorial, I always work with other consultants. So like even ask them, do we start NSAIDs in this group or in this patient, or do I need to give gabapentin? Uh, so if they are, if they are like um, skeptic, skeptical about it or uh, not sure about it, I also avoid it, then I play strongly on the psychosocial aspect because once you deal with that adequately, people know how to cope with things. And then you use the opioids as well. I use a lot of opioids and paracetamol. Uh, I have a patient who had uh, fibroids from week 13 to week 37. And they were degenerating and painful and all that should be admitted for three weeks and then discharged for two weeks, comes back with another bout. I gave her morphines, pentapine, oxycodones, infusions. There's a time I gave her a, a gabba painting and you, the pain becomes so much. Now you have to save the mother or you have to reduce this distress, I mean, the, the stress of the, the mother that she has, such that doesn't distress the the, the, doesn't stress the pregnancy. Uh, but after after like four weeks or four, two admissions of, of that, we started involving the neonatologist uh, to be standby in case this woman delivers anytime because the pain was so much may trigger uh, premature labor or goes to term, the neonatologist is ready to, to deal with a, a baby who may be dependent on opioids. Um, likely enough, by week 37, pain had reduced to just beta pain once in a while, Tramado. Uh, and then we, uh, by week 39, she was delivered. This is section, baby squad. Well, baby is now five years old. I met them recently, and I was one, uh, uh, and, and, and I was telling the baby that one day when you grow, we'll give you a story about certain things. And so, um, so that's one of the cases we had that was a dilemma and I didn't know what to do with it. Uh, so use the WHO ladder. Uh, the, the thing is that I, I think you all know about it. Uh, originally it used to have three steps, but they've added a fourth step where we look at nerve blocks, epidurals, PCA pumps, neurolytic uh, block therapy or spinal stimulators. The, the, the last three, and being used in non-pregnant mothers. Uh, and uh, most people, when we talk about a ladder, we, we automatically think of climbing a ladder. 
However, I would like you to know, to remember, you can also climb downwards. Climbing up a ladder, or you can climb down a ladder, or you can start in the middle of the ladder and go up and down. The key point in pain management is, number one, don't manage it like the way you manage uh, infections. Infections, once you have the right antibiotic, just give the medication either BD or D or Etaware, and you keep checking parameters, nothing much. It won't change much unless there's now a new flare of the infection. For pain, remember that it is in live tissues and live tissues have like a temperament. They, they have a personality. Uh, you, may, you, you, you may be actually doing the right thing, but the thing just flares up. And so you have to regularly follow up your patient and especially if they're admitted and requiring parenteral medication, assess them every four hours, try to keep your pain, pay the pain below four, and then always use your PRN medications, uh, or PCA, give the patient a PCA so that they can, uh, they can uh, remember to, to keep the pain below four and, 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 and can also, surprise you. So when you do your, your pain scores with the uh, pain assessment with the every four hours with the vital signs, you may be able to, to preempt a certain flare up of pain. Now, one of the things that pain does, if it is severe, it, it overstretches the healthcare system. Uh, for those who run clinics, if a patient comes that has chronic pain and is severe, uh, that patient is going to take away almost an hour from your time. And most people, I asked one time people who run uh, outpatient clinics, uh, internal medicine, I asked them uh, what, uh, what's their commonest conditions, flu, uh, gastritis, diarrhea, and how long does it take to see patients? Maybe five to eight minutes. But when ask them how long does a pain patient take for them, the one who has come with pain that is not going away and this is like the fifth time to go to you're seeing them, they say like maybe an hour or sometimes 30 minutes. Now you can imagine 30 minutes how many people you'd have seen. Uh, and so that stretches the system. And now not to be stretched, some people uh, talk to their nurses or people outside and they put the patient last so that they have time uh, enough for that patient. And then the patient, because it's last and they came early, ends up messing up the other base patients who are outside. So the, the whole dynamism is bad. So when you have any patients and you have a patient on a bed and the pain intensifies, uh, you find that they scream so much that even the neighbors safest deal with that patient. And so it will stop your vital signs taking, it will stop your admissions, it will stop your discharge, stop your medication, stop your taking patients to theater, stop patients being brought from theater. If for one hour or two hours, that word seems like it is stopped. So most of the time I ask uh, the team members, uh, look here, engage your pain specialists uh, so that they offload this burden. And you know, when somebody is screaming, they can come up with all comments uh, that can also irritate you. They can abuse you, insult you, or say that you don't care and all that and it's them and sometimes they when that phase goes away they can apologize or they too ashamed or too uh, anyway they sometimes don't apologize so remember go up and down the ladder or come from up uh, hit the pain hard so if you are having patients who are getting opioids but they are getting really drowsy and desaturating remember to use uh, local anesthetics nerve blocks. Let me share with you two cases uh, that I've had recently so that you can possibly see what we do, uh, what I go through. Um, case one is a 26 year old prime gravid, 27 weeks of gestation. It was on follow up for back pain by a spine surgeon, but then came with, with low back pain, severe associated with left lower limb radiculopathy. She had a previous history of spinal injection one year prior to admission uh, due to a disc bulge. And she was being followed up by endome for endometriosis by the admitting uh, obstetrician. And now she was pregnant and she was having the radical tramadol beta pin at home and had stopped working 
well for her. Remember, uh, pregnant ladies can have back pain. Now imagine the, she had back pain before she got pregnant. Now it flared up. She was admitted via A and E and started on parenteral analgesics, paracetamol and morphine. We avoided NSAIDs. Pain improved from eight to nine out of 10 to six. Was reviewed by a spine surgeon. The MRI was normal, uh, no neurological deficits and recommended to continue with pain management. We explained to the patient uh, about pain, that may, pain may be due to musculoskeletal strain. There's what we call mechanical low back pain due to strains. And uh, those strains can be so powerful that they irritate the nerves and create a sciatic kind of picture. It's not like a radiculopathy, like a proper nerve damage, but it radiates the pain. So we call it radicular pain. So we recommended an interlaminar epidural steroid injection with a two he needle uh, without imaging test fire. Most of the time we do, when we do epidural steroid injections, we use an X-ray machine, CM, and contrast to see uh, that we have put the, we are, we are going to put the steroid in the and the local anesthetic in the epidural space. So now she's pregnant, we can't do, use a C arm, and most of the time they're like in prone position, and she's so pregnant that we can't put her in prone position. So we did an epidural, like how we are supposed to, how we do for labor epidural, and we put a catheter. Uh, so this time, instead of putting a catheter, we gave uh, a solution, 10 mils of local anesthesia together with the uh, steroid. Uh, it, 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 it helped a lot, uh, but we had to teach her and tell her, look here, the, there's a risk of causing a dural puncture, an accidental dural puncture, and that would bring a post-dural puncture headache and all that. So although she was in pain, she was very cooperative because uh, some of the accidents happen if patient is jumping around and so we have to infiltrate uh, adequately in the interspinal space so that there are no sudden surprises for the patient in terms of jumping because of pain. By day one, post-op pain was reduced to three out of 10 from eight to, uh, eight to nine. She had slept well. There were no signs of post uh headache. She was discharged on after days or five days of admission. Radiating pain was two. Pain from the needle pricks at the back of six out of 10. We reassured her that uh, that will get better with healing and with medication. Discharge out medication of beta pain, beta and trauma dog, 50 milligrams PRN, but, but four hours apart uh, from beta pain. Uh, sometimes the pain can be so intense that we give beta pain and trauma dog, but alternate rather than take them at the same time and then have severe drowsiness and nausea. Uh, give a beta pain every eight hours, like 6 a.m., 2 p.m., 10 p.m., and then somewhere around 10 a.m., if the pain comes, the patient can take 50 milligrams of tramadol, then 6 p.m., 50 milligrams of tramadol, or 2 a.m., 50 milligrams of tramadol. There are people who have severe pain, it wakes them up, so you have to have something to give them, to, to push them to the morning. Otherwise, they will not sleep, and then they will start distracting, this, this trusting the medication and that frustration sometimes leads them to non-compliance. So we added on the central and do for, on the central nose to take care of the any nausea caused by trauma. The second case was a 30-hour-old prime gravita, 25 weeks of gestation, referred from Congo for further evaluation and management with a working diagnosis of metastatic breast cancer by Dr. Casinoma. She had the metastasis to the liver with mild hepatic dysfunction and the spine as well. Severe abdominal pain and back pain of eight out of 10. She had a history of right breast mastectomy, very conscious of exposing that area. When, when they called me to come and see her, she would always cover, in, um, she would be writhing around, uh, moving around, restless in bed, but remember to cover the scar uh, of the breast. You know how some uh, some patients with labor pain end up walking naked, the pain is too much. Uh, this one was very conscious of uh, her appearance as well. And that, sometimes that throws off people, uh, uh, throws off people and they think people, the person is malingering. Uh, what we look at 
when they do that, we, should, we see that they are actually hyper vigilant, hyper alert and hypersensitive to, to things. And that hypersensitivity or hyper vigilance actually is a, one of those uh, flags we talk about the, the psychosocial flags. Once you see somebody is hyper vigilant or hypersensitive about their appearance or whatever, it can be a telltale sign that their nervous system is so sensitive that even their pain is, is uh, amplified a lot. Uh, and she wasn't speaking English. Uh, English was not good. So she was speaking through her sister-in-law who was married to her husband. Uh, and so both of them are here in Kenya. Uh, they, they are like, they have each other and they can imagine. So she was insisting, she still insists that she wants to, to deliver her baby. This is her only baby. Uh, she knows the prognosis is not good at least. Uh, she, 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 she gets to, to go to the next phase of life, leaving a, her husband a child on this earth. And the husband is not around, is working, uh, promising to come towards the time of delivery. Uh, pain management, when I was invited, was paroxysmal and severe, but I found the patient at that point, the pain was low, three out of 10. She put in the current, that current analgesis at that time, Tramadol dexamethasone, we were working. She was saying paracetamol was working much better despite the liver dysfunction. So she refused the, my suggestions of morphine, pethidine, PRN, and she talked to her relatives who are very scared about morphine. Um, most people are scared of morphine and the strong opioids. Uh, then, uh, yeah, so she refused. And then she was kept on that regimen. Uh, then just give her the pain education, what to expect and everything. Two days later, she had chemotherapy and that in intensified pain. Chemotherapy can cause a neuropathy. Uh, or sometimes tissue irritation increases inflammation, especially in the metastatic tissues. So the pain increased. She got a radiculopathy. She couldn't even sit or step down. So we started a morphine infusion. This time she said, do whatever you want to do. Give her a morphine infusion with a PCA. That controlled her pain. Within six hours, she was able to walk to the toilet and she was really happy. And then two days later, we discharged her on beta pin and PRN or morphine. And then we, no, we didn't discharge after two days. We turned to oral. And then uh, we, went, we were like, uh, uh, sometimes even us, we get traumatized by these pains. So uh, she got the chemotherapy on a Tuesday. By Wednesday, she was really doing badly. So we started the PCA. We, by Friday, we had changed to orals. Now this is like Saturday, Sunday, waiting for the next Tuesday's chemo. So we kept her around waited to see how she, did, she responds to the next chemo. She did well and we discharged her on slow release morphine twice a day with the, with the uh, screw softeners. And the beta pin was supposed to be given in between the doses of morphine, uh, but as required. We, I gave her my number, direct number, and the, knowing that they are here, they can struggle with airtime, uh, told them they can call me on WhatsApp and everything. That kind of uh, pacifies the patient a lot. It, it reveals, relieves uh, anxiety a lot, knowing that I can get, I can be taken care of. We told her, look here, you can even come to casualty, we inject you, you go back to where you stand. She was tired of being in hospital. 10 days later, she was readmitted in a, a A and E with a severe pain. You can imagine even that time she came, in the 10 days she came, she had chemotherapy, went back, she did well. So she was readmitted. And uh, number one, as a red flag, I said, go and check if it is labor pain. I said, is, there, is it back pain? I said, yeah, back pain is there, but the, the radiculopathy is not there. So I said, go check if it is labor pain. And if people called me, oh, she's in pain. I said, yeah, first call the obstetricians. We rule out because management strategies are going to be different. If you have to deliver this patient or if you're not going to deliver this patient, they're different. And uh, they came, they find out it wasn't it. And so uh, by the time I reached, I told them give her a morphine injection because uh, when you're given pain medications, you look at uh, the route of administration, uh, the dose, the frequency. The route of administration, if somebody is having nausea, vomiting, don't keep pushing tablets. Uh, give IM, give IV. 
if they have burnt skin and they still need parenteral, look for central line uh, and use it. Uh, something like that. Sometimes we're in a hurry, we, we, we don't look at those small things and yet they can make an impact. The frequency, the frequency is very interesting. Uh, I've found that in, in yeah, when we say take medication three times a day, we mean every eight hours in 24 hours. But the public take it, they, they, their day is daylight. So they, and then they are so diligent and so they bear commands very well. All, there's a story out there that you have to take medication with the, with the meals. So they wake up and wait for breakfast. Imagine they have painkiller, which is eight hourly. They wake up, take breakfast, take the medication after breakfast. Now their breakfast can be 7 a.m. or 9 a.m. And then they will take with lunch, which can be 1 p.m., 2 p.m., and with dinner, which can be 8 p.m., 10 p.m. Now, if they take the medication, the last dose at 8 p.m. or 9 p.m., they'll wake up around 4, 5 a.m. or 3 a.m. Uh, in pain. And now, because they are diligent, you said in the day, they'll wait till morning and then till breakfast, and they'll start not trusting the medications. So some of the medications is like, take it at this time. Uh, we, we explain them, them uh, how medications work and the timing. And then the, yeah, the dose, uh, some people take, give them beta pin and the two tablets, a, a tawali, and then they start taking it one tablet or two tablets or as required. All those things make a difference. So we, yeah, we thought of, yeah, we thought of maybe it is a exacerbation of metastatic inflammation. We also explored the psychosocial uh, part. Now, uh, how we did that is that uh, after she had settled, she looked well, she was smiling, she was asking to go home and all that. I asked her, how was the week? Uh, the time you have been away, have you gone to any clinic to get injections? She said, no, this is the first time I've come for an injection. So what, what, what happened in that 10 days? They said, uh, I don't know. It's only that I had some false labors for a week. And they, oh, maybe uh, they, now the attendant was like, maybe uh, yesterday morning, because they came, uh, they called me at 3 a.m. that the following day. Yesterday morning, she got to know a friend of hers who had twins at a cesarean section and died. Now, when when people uh, when look at when we look at cognitive behavioral therapy, we look at what are your thoughts, and what th those thoughts, what associated emotions and feelings ex uh, accompany those thoughts, because the emotions and the feelings will dictate how the body acts or the actions of the body, the behaviors and the habits of the body. And that whole combination leads to what we call uh, a way of being and acting of that person. So now if you have thoughts like, oh, I'm getting better, there's a way of being and acting that, that accompanies that thought. And then if you start thinking bad things, there's a way of being and acting that accompanies. And now, most of the time when we are thinking bad things, bad thoughts, painful thoughts and all that, we contract the body, we go into a state of, uh, of stress, which is fight, flight or freeze. And that kind of uh, clenches the whole musculoskeletal system. Now with the background of pain in the abdominal wall, pain in the, in the back, in the viscera, uh, you don't know what she did after that. And probably now everything is escalated, including you remember the meaning making machines, what re reality she had or what uh, perception. So I, I ended up listing everything to, to my colleagues. I told them because they were like, should we discharge her? I said, yeah, let's discharge her. If we don't discharge her, she will be distressed again for being in the hospital. So I told them, look here, this is a, a, a young girl, 26 years, newly married. The CA mastectomy, uh, metastasis, prognosis is bad. You know, chemotherapy it comes with its own issues. She's a foreigner, translated through a sister-in-law. So she's dealing with a lot of intimate things with her sister-in-law. Uh, and nobody likes being uh, talking through translators or interpreters. They may mess up the information. And again, you don't even know how to complain. And then you have this pain that comes and 
triggers automatic negative thoughts. The husband is not around. Uh, this is the person you love. Your brother who's married to your sister is also not around. Everything. So the whole, and then you're in a foreign country. You know? uh, yeah. So the whole picture is so marked that the chances of triggering pains are very high. So uh, we, we we even asked them to, to see if they can talk to their husbands to come. And the brother-in-law comes, the brother to the, the patient, uh, the husband to the in-law, and then the, 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 the husband of the, of the patient can come later. So we discussed all those things, had a cognitive behavior session and discharged her. We are still looking after her. Thank you very much. Thank you for your attention. Um, yeah, I think Esther and David can take over. Wow, thank you. That was quite uh, insightful. We are glad at least you were able to take us through that great session. And uh, we have quite an audience, uh, 1,900 and in counting. Which is which is great, and uh, we all appreciate your participation in today's webinar. Uh, before uh, we close, I have some few questions, or we have some few questions that were uh, written as the session went went on, eh? and so I'm sure Dr. Mwaka will be glad to take those questions. I will read uh, the questions just one after the other, and then he will be able to respond. So the first question came from <clears throat> Melissa Yvonne, uh, asking, hello, is it okay to consider pubis symphysis dysfunction as a differential and a causes of abdominal abdomen pelvic pain? Can I answer that? Yes. Uh, yes, uh, it is part of that abdominal pelvic pain. I had uh, I had a patient one time uh, who who had that and so severe uh, the all the adductor muscles and the quadriceps where they were attached and everything was so painful that the only way she could walk was to walk backwards because any step forward was causing pain. We we gave uh, local anesthetics at the at the most painful areas, and that helped. But then, being local anesthesia, it it uh, it, it it wore off, and then the pain uh, came back again. Uh, she was around thirty six weeks at that time. The pelvis was so uh, the the, uh, the the pregnancy was so heavy. We had to get her uh, a pregnancy support. Uh, that you wear and support to, to elevate the pregnancy of the pelvis. She did that movement uh, backwards. She would climb stairs backwards, move uh, backwards, uh, everything backwards. She, we got her a walker to move backwards to be stable. Uh, and uh, after delivery, within I think two months, she was back to normal. So it's part of that. Great, uh, and, and it, it, I imagine you know from psychosocial coping aspects when people saw her walking backwards and what went through her mind. But again, we different, <laughs> yeah. We we had to write the report to the workplace to give her a sequel until she delivered. Uh, that backed her because she used to struggle to go to work, and you can imagine at workplace in town and the, all that. Uh, it, that wouldn't work for long. But uh, uh, two months later, I met her in a mall. She's the one who remembered me because uh, now she had lost all the weight. Uh, and they, they, she showed me the, the, oh, thank you for the questions. <laughs> yeah, she, 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 she told me this way. Well. Mm. Okay. Great to know. So just carry on. I've picked all the questions from the Q&A. Uh, so number Lisa, two. Now. That from Lisa. Irene Olo, lovely presentation. Can you help us understand the mechanism of pain conduction where 
patients who have had chronic pain still feel pain even when they are cured? Who do we or how do we overcome this since when they don't take their analgesics, they feel pain despite finishing treatment? There is a, there is a concept called central sensitization. I don't know whether you know about it. Um, usually when you have uh, when you have pain, no. There, there is a, uh, is everybody here a medic? David? Majority would be, but uh, I'm there sure there are, there's a good number who is not, who are not uh, medics. So okay. the majority would be healthcare professionals. Okay, because I want to use the medical terminologies, but knowing that, I may have to simplify. simplify. There are receptors, there are many receptors in the body. And so the receptors that uh, that pick up and uh, that will generate an impulse that is going to be interpreted as pain are called nociceptors. And the stimuli that produces, that stimulates the nociceptors is called a noxious stimuli. Now, once the noxious stimuli comes, let's say a sting of, the mo of a mosquito, it stimulates the nociceptors that generate an impulse that runs from through the nerves that go to the spinal cord. In the spinal cord, they, are, they, are, they connect with other nerves called interneurons and cross over to another side to, to be picked up by other neurons that run straight to the brain. The neurons are called spinothalamic tracts. They come from the spine to the thalamus in the brain. The thalamus is called is basically the relaying mechanism in the brain. Now it relay to the higher centers where there are emotions, where there are memories, where there are interpretative mechanisms and all that. And also before it reaches the thalamus, it goes via the closer to the brainstem where we have the, the centers for rudimentary functions like breathing, sweating, uh, nausea, vomiting, um, pressure, and all that. And that's why when you get pain, people can sweat, they can breathe hard, they can vomit, they can have a high blood pressure or tachycardia, a high speed of palpitations. Now, all that, we call it the nociceptive process. We don't call it pain. Until it has reached the higher centers, that interpretation is made, and then the mind comes up and says, ouch, you have pain, okay? Now, when you have pain, it also stimulates another set of fibers that come from the brain down to the body, and sometimes it shuts down the system. That explains why when people are so excited, they don't feel pain or when they are in that excited state, very stressed with adrenaline, they don't have pain. So we have inside our body mechanisms that control pain. That's why you feel good when you do exercises and your pain reduces because you have endorphins. Now, there are times if you don't manage the pain well, okay? If you don't manage the pain well, the, the nociceptive process can be so much that it overwhelms the inhibitory process. And now the nervous system is plastic, what we call neuroplasticity. It is plastic, so it is moldable. And so the nervous system changes. And because human beings like protecting themselves and all that, the system learns to protect itself. So the thing that used to be not painful like putting on a trouser and the trouser touches the leg, the body senses it as if it is painful. Now, the fibers that shut down, sometimes also when you stimulate the fibers that take messages to the brain, what we call the large fibers, they are A beta, A beta fibers or uh, A gamma fibers, they overshadow the small fibers of the pain. And that's why when people rub their thigh, they don't feel pain. Or when the mosquito stings and they slap themselves, they don't feel pain. Or when they're 
standing and rocking around, they don't feel pain because they're using mechanical receptors to override the pain receptors. So now, if you don't control pain and the pain keeps, the messages keep coming, the nociceptive messages, they overwhelm the nervous system and then it molds itself to sense pain even if the system is no longer, uh, the, even if the body is healed. It is similar to, if I put you in China right now, for those who don't know China, with it, and you go to a place where they don't speak Swahili or any African language and English or French, within a few days, you will learn the words of asking for food, water, and sleeping, okay? Why? Because the stress is so much you have to learn. And once you've learned, you will not forget because of that kind of stress. But if somebody comes here and teaches you Chinese words, within two days, you have forgotten them. Or people who are left-handed and they were beaten until they learned how to use the right hand. Once they learned, they didn't what? They didn't forget. So the same thing. These traumatic things become like an overwhelming thing to the nervous system until it molds and becomes what? Becomes a, uh, becomes kind of permanent. And so it requires another overwhelming thing to maybe reverse the system. That could explain why, uh, why, why the pain is that much. The patient with multiple sclerosis, autoimmune CNSD medication has high CPK levels and should be sit with the new pain symptoms. How do we manage pain due to high creatinine phosphokinase repeat levels if it is true? Uh, Esther, you'll help me with this one. Uh, Esther, unfortunately, is... Uh... No, I'm, I'm still in, oh, David, but yeah, yeah, ah, okay. for, for this question, I am not sure of the answer either, but uh, I think the principles of pain management are the same. Usually we start with pain assessment and we choose the medication by the WHO ladder, but this is now a question that rheumatologists can help us better in how to manage that pain. Yes. And uh, uh, yeah, you, you, you still go back to the basics and look at the model, biopsychosocial model, biological, uh, what is the offending problem, educate the patient. Some of them it's fear, a lot of fear. Uh, and so you manage that. And some of them, the sleeping patterns, sometimes uh, fatigue and the, these other psychological and social things that are in the background. But most of the time when people learn what they are going through or their condition, uh, it kind of demystifies the problem. And so you can discuss with your colleagues who manage this problem. And probably if they have the right medication for the problem, the symptom may reduce. Can opiates be prescribed in all trinesters of pregnancy? I, I do prescribe, I do. And I think self, if you look at the table, it is safe, but most of the time when pain is mild, uh, paracetamol deals with it. Uh, paracetamol deals with it well. The the one uh, the one I'm not comfortable with, and I don't know, is because people don't do many, many researches. Are uh, um, like things like anticonvulsants, gabapentins, and the Redica. But sometimes you have to use them if pain is overwhelming. Sorry, I'm, I'm just copying, bringing in more questions, but carry on. Now okay. uh, we're on number five, Lydia Mansia. No, uh, in civil societies, women have a right to choose pain relief in their birth plan. Are we too poor to offer video in Africa? What does it take to empower women more on preferences in pain relief in labor? Sometimes I've thought labor pain is beyond 10 mark. Visceral pain, visceral pain, no joke. It wants some women to choose death. Uh, yeah, we remember we are coming from millennia of women who know how to cope and everything, and sometimes have made a meaning that uh, you are woman enough if you go through 
labor pain. And you respect that. And sometimes people, not everybody requires an epidural or nitrous oxide or water bath or anything. However, my take also is with this technology we have, the options have to be offered uh, and we have to train ourselves. But they also come as a service and the all services uh, require, um, require a financial aspect to it in order for them to continue um, to continue being provided. The, we have to educate our insurance or medical funders to support patients uh, with that kind of uh, service. We have to train ourselves and many people with it. The problem with labor pain, it has no appointment. It just comes the way it wants. Uh, and so with few people who are around, you may find that they are not available or they are in theater because most of it's done by anesthetists anyway. Uh, and some of them are so uh, panicking, they want that straight up before using the other non pharmacological or other pharmacological methods. But yeah, you're right, we, there's a financial implication to it. And, uh, and, and that can be, I think that can be sorted out as, as communities. Uh, as you said, those uh, people with the good economies have learned how to put it even in their kind of NHIF or government uh, government insurances. Um, and so, uh, once it is once the, all that is done, insurance companies can fund. Uh, relatives can't can't talk negatively about it. The medical personnel are trained, and there are many people who can do that. Midwives can uh, can uh, manage it. I tell I tell our midwives, look here. The moment you put an epidural, you're going to have very and it works well. You're going to have very good labor experience. The father they won't bother you. The relatives won't bother you. The patient won't scream. You are able to monitor them and monitor other people. It creates an ambience that uh, gives you this experience of of wanting more, uh, but when the, when labor is bad and people are screaming, then the experience becomes different. I hope I've answered that question. Esther, do you have any answer to that? No, I don't have any additions for that. Okay. Uh, apart from steroids, what other drugs are used to for epidural analgesia? What's the longest duration of time a patient can be on morphine? Uh, the, the one I had in my own experience was uh, that lady with fibroids. That was over five months. Uh, I think five months or during the pregnancy, something or four months. Uh, we don't use uh, now epidural analgesia. Are you meaning a labor analgesia or analgesia for like normal chronic back pain that other people have and all that? Uh, like for the patient I gave the examples because of maybe irritation on the nerves and the disc bulge creating an inflammation that is irritating the nerves. So we had to put on a, a steroid and also it helps to reduce inflammation since we are not using NSAIDs. However, when we are doing a, for labor, we use uh, an opioid and uh, a local anesthetic. And uh, some, some people also add uh, alpha-2 agonists. Uh, I think Dexmed, Dexmed can also be used if pain is a lot. Yeah. Um, I don't see any other. Right now, I don't see any other that we use for epidural pain control. Although when we have uh, sympathetic chains uh, causing complex pain, like complex regional pain syndrome, uh, or pains that are, seas, uh, that are sympathetically mediated pains, we end up using uh, alcohol or phenol, some neurolytic agents. Uh, and sometimes uh, I think they use uh, glucose or something like that for if people have scars in the epidural space to try to to, to reduce the, the scar tissues. 
But in terms of labor, uh, we use local anesthesia and the fentanyl. Some people use remifentanyl, I think. Yeah. Uh, for Khadija, how do you handle fibro degeneration pain in pregnancy? A number of clients don't respond to progesterone, so no opioids, hydration. Uh, we, we've used, I've used the opioids that is similar to that patient with the fibroids. Uh, you may have to give an infusion. You may have to give an infusion. You may have to give a PCA. Uh, um, sometimes if the pain is a lot, you can put an epidural catheter and infuse local anesthesia. But that may lead to that may lead to that may lead to numbness in the lower limbs and also need to, for catheterization. But then you can't keep it in for long because you you may get translocation of bacteria. So you use it as a way of intervening quickly the pain for pain while you are optimizing the other painkillers and possibly also investigating the patient. Uh, pain patients don't, won't give you a lot of pain information if their pain is above six. Uh, they just want you to intervene as soon as possible. So once you use those kind of modalities to bring it down, then you, you also have a chance to, to counsel, to educate, to tease out those things we were talking about earlier. What's the doses of morphine on obstetric patient? How about the safety on respiratory effects? Um, the doses are similar, almost similar to normal people uh, who are not pregnant. They are normal as well, but uh, what I meant is those who are not pregnant. Uh, morphine, I usually use 0 0.1 milligrams per meal, and the one milligram per meal for pethidine and trauma the one million per meal as well. But then the key point here is to titrate uh, your, your medication. Otherwise, people change their metabolism when they are pregnant. They either become hyper or lower. You never know, they, even their requirements may go up. Uh, so the key point is to keep assessing the patient regularly. How safe is the paclitaxel in pregnancy? I, I really don't know. Uh, the, the team chose that that's what they're going to do even before they called me in. But uh, I, I think they had to give something. Uh, they had to give something to support the patient. Esther, do you have any answer on that? Uh, I think what, what I have read is that most chemotherapies are not safe in the first trimester but they can be used with caution from second trimester. So the oncologists have more experience with medication. So whenever there's a pregnant patient, they try to choose a medication where the risks to the fetus outweigh the benefits. I mean, the benefits outweigh the risks to the fetus. And, and, the, the, and this is where the, the, power, the power of my disciplinary approach to managing cases comes in. Uh, and now you can't even have an excuse with the, you see how we have even a Zoom. So wherever you are and you have internet, network, uh, uh, internet, you can call your colleagues, you can have a meeting, set up a meeting and support your patients. Uh, but I, I guess it, 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 I can't give you the details of that medication, but so far so good for her. You can even see um, she has had several, uh, the one we have has had several cycles without triggering that much pain until she had this psychosocial issue that also compounded the, the false pain, the false labor pain she was having. How do you balance the risk of neonatal opioid withdrawal and the use of opioids in pregnancy? Uh, number one, always mother comes first uh, because if again, if you don't manage her, the distress, the stress she goes through may cause problems for the pregnancy, uh, but use a team, use the, you have uh, opioid withdrawal, I mean, opioid antagonists at hand when you deliver a baby and watch the baby carefully. Uh, the neonatologists know how to follow the patient for some time to, to, to see that the patient is safely withdrawn. They also look for withdrawal effects 
if the other patient may be very irritable or sweaty and tachycardic, uh, and the other signs they look for in the neonet, and possibly put them back on opioids and then withdraw them slowly or use some other medications or other, some other strategies. Is there, is there a concern on the use of both on the central and tromadol case one, considering the risk of serotonin uh, syndrome? That's why we put the tromadol as, as required. Uh, um, yeah, as required. And also it can also happen with the, the placebo. But then that's why we, 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 we always give uh, our numbers to our patients to, to know that they are taken care of in case they have an issue. Um, Cesar Kamami, are uh, there surgeon factors that influence pain, fundal pressure to release stark fetal head during the delivery, length of incision, use, does use of that and worsen post operative pain? We know that if you don't handle tissues very well, they are going to be traumatized. And then when you traumatize the tissue so much, it can lead to can lead to a significant production of what we call the inflammatory juice. Now, if the inflammatory juice also goes and stimulates the receptor beds to be increased up regulation, then the demands increase. And now if you give your normal dosing or you neglect your frequency of medication, the experience is going to be of worsened pain. And so you're right, data may can do that. Uh, uh, manipulating tissues badly can do that. Role of common drugs in public rural facilities that will definitely endocid in pregnancy. Um, well, the, if that's what you have, that's what you have. Uh, but that is not really an excuse uh, to not get other medications or even use local anesthesia. But I know rural areas sometimes lack um equipment and medication and so uh, in uh, involving people as many as possible in that type, type of psychosocial aspect can help you when you don't have many things try to use the psychosocial side as well as much as possible but i know sometimes because of lack of personnel things can overwhelm and the work becomes too much you find you don't have even the time to do the some counseling or get even a counselor. Maybe you don't even have a counselor. Uh, it becomes a dilemma. Uh, but preparing such talks like this starts opening up spaces in which we can be able to play and uh, work on uh, on bridging gaps. During the first trimester, which pain cares are safe um, for us? I. Uh, I'm going to give you the presentation. You look up the one of those slides. One of those slides has which medications to use. Best presentation. What is the best painkiller for chronic adenomyosis? Wow, I'm, I'm telling you, it doesn't work like this. It doesn't work like a pain best painkiller. It works like which, what is the best strategy? Because we are going to involve other people. You're going to 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 do counseling. You're going to you may even do hysterectomy. You, the, 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 if you focus on just the best painkiller, you may end up missing out on the other, the other uh, ways of managing this pain. Esther, do you have an answer for that? Thank you for the claps and the love. And and the and the and the fireworks. Sure, and probably uh, maybe you could answer the last the last question. Uh, uh, can you put it back? Oh, sorry. I, uh, I, I, oh my God! Uh, you make me tear up here. <laughs> <laughs> this is this is uh, this is the best response I've ever had. Thank you, everyone. And and you have one thousand six hundred people. Actually, we we were we were at some point we were hitting almost two thousand. It's been it's been one of the best uh, attended CMEs. I mean webinars. 
So the last question was someone after CS complains so much, uh, so much on pain, so severe in anesthesia site of injection so much. So what could be the problem? Uh, can you give Edwin to, can you give him the rights to ask? Because I don't know what he's asking. Is it uh, anesthesia site? Is it the injection for a GA induction or is it for spinal? Or is it for epidural? I, um, I don't know. Okay, let me answer that. Let me answer that way. Uh, okay. Most likely, he's he talking about spinal anesthesia. Okay. And he can write in the chat room, uh, in the chat to see, to see whether, uh, to, to confirm. You can check on that. For, for spinal anesthesia, it depends on um, the needle type you're using and the technique you're using. Uh, and how much tissue you are you you have you have done uh, how many times you have attempted as well as the your your pain management and then on top of that once the, the patient has delivered what kind of exercises do they do now i um if you use a gauge 22 black spinal needle or gauge 20 you're going to have posterior puncture headache uh, prevalence increasing. You're going to have many tissues uh, damaged. Sometimes the scrapping on the interspinal, the spinous processes may cause pain. So you have to infiltrate uh, a lot of local anesthesia to make it comfortable for the patient and also use the small needles like a uh, gauge 25. If you, if you, are having difficulty with gauge 25, then use the gauge 23, 22, no, gauge 21 needle, which is the green needle, or gauge 20, gauge 18, uh, pink needle, as your introducer, if you don't have an introducer. But don't put it so deep, because if it punctures the dura, and now you're going to, get, you're going to have, you're going to have uh, the spinal headache. So sometimes I use those needles as my introducers, to figure out, I give a local, a lot of local anesthesia, to, so that I use those needles to, to to look for the interspinal space, and then when I put it in like one centimeter into the spinal space, the needle is stable. Then I can put the small gauge twenty five or gauge 22, 20, 20, or gauge twenty five needle. If you use an epidural combined spinal epidural kit, the the, the epidural needle is gauge 18, but the, also the spinal needle is 27. So chances of posterior puncture headaches are low. Okay, great. Uh, it's it's uh, been one and a half hour yeah. of talk. And, if, it, uh, if, it, if it is on the hand, I, oh, I, sorry. Pos possibly you have also, you put your cannula next to a tendon or something or a nerve. Thank you, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mwaka. That has been quite uh, uh, a teaching. And Hello. someone commented that uh, it's uh, the best topic during the midwife's week. And so very insightful. And from where we sit in terms of palliative care and pain and symptom management, uh, this was really well done. Thank you so much for you know sharing a lot of knowledge and also your experience uh, the two case scenarios were quite uh, difficult cases if i would say but also the team uh, did quite a good job and uh, you can see the claps and the heart emojis and it's really it's really insightful so we come to close at that point, and uh, I'm sure there is an announcement. There were many questions around CPD points, and uh, the KNH team kept answering on the chat. So I didn't want to touch on that. But uh, from where I sit, we are grateful. And as we continue with this series, I just want to kindly uh, announce that we have a palliative care conference coming uh, uh, in November in Kisumu. And so if you could visit the KEPCA, Kenya Hospices and Palliative Care Association website, you get further details. So over to KNH team. Thank you so much, Dr. Mwaka, and many claps. Great appreciation for 
being part of this, Dr. Nafula and the palliative care unit uh, uh, pain team, you're doing a good job. We are proud of you. Kenyatta, you're the best. I mean, with a webinar, having uh, an audience of over, I mean, about 2,000 people is not a joke. So keep it up. The, I mean, keep up the good work and let's continue learning. Any closing remarks, Dr. Mwaka? I, I, I really am feeling very emotional. I'm also having psychosocial issues now after seeing these Z clubs. <laughs> well, thank you. Thank you, everyone. And uh, from the tone of the questions that uh, were presented, um, I can see um, um, I, 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 whatever I said fell on good ground. And I, I uh, David, you can ask uh, is Esther to share yes. my email. Uh -huh. uh, I sent out my, I gave her my email, which is uh, both work and the Gmail. Uh, I know some people can have questions and then we, we can talk. Uh, I okay. think I think pain management is a, is a, a service that we need to create more awareness. And especially if we are supporting patients, why don't we support our colleagues? That's very true. Uh, we will talk with the KNH research team and see how that can be shared. Oh, there it is. Gilbertmwaka at gmail.com. Yes. Thank you. Dr. Dr. Esther, any any closing remarks before I hand over back to you? Uh, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Mwaka, for accepting our invitation. We have learned a lot from you this afternoon. Thank you to David for moderating the session and thank you to our audience for staying through the whole session. Our next webinar will be coming up in June and we'll be talking about chronic pain management. Thank you so much. We, we, are, we can live at our own pleasure now. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, Asante sana. I can leave as well. You're free to leave at pleasure. Yes, yes. <laughs> <laughs> bye bye. Esther, thank you very day. much. And thank you for poking me many times. <laughs> thank you, David. Thank you. Bye bye. Bye bye.